Hello and welcome to session three in this online course taking you through Laws of Form by George Spencer Brown. In this session we're going to recap on the two basic initials that formed the majority of the content of chapters one to three and then we're going to go deeply into theorems one to three presented in chapter four and look at the proof step by step for each of them. All the page numbers you'll see referred to on screen are to the 2011 edition of Laws of Form. We met the initials already and we learned how to condense two marks into one and how to confirm one mark as a multiple of marks having the same value. We learned also how to cancel two nested marks because they're equivalent to the blank space in which they appear. And that means that we can make a compensatory act by adding them in wherever there is a blank space, wherever we want to. Now, Spencer Brown uses those initials to build theorems in what he calls the primary arithmetic. From those very simple beginnings, he builds a whole system, a calculus of indications that you can use to work things out with. But at this point, it's useful to stop and reflect on the origins of the word arithmetic. Now, if we go back to ancient Greece, we have rhythmos, which means flow, and arithmos, which means counting. There's a sense of there being a brokenness to it, a, one, two, a start and a stop that goes alongside the flow, if you like, or breaks it. it. One is dependent on the other. So from these initials, he says we're going to treat these in shorthand form and refer to them as I1 and I2. And I1 he calls number and I2 he calls order. What does he mean by number and order? Well, in the notes to chapter 4, which are useful accompanying explanatory um, pieces of text for each chapter, each chapter has its own set of notes and it's well worth going through these because they explain a lot of the background detail to what is essentially a very minimalistic, elegant, but also sparse text. So here's how he explains number. Number is sufficient to unify a divided space, but not to void a cloven space. What does he mean by divided and cloven? What kind of space is he talking about here? Well, let's take divided first. Any division of a space, he says, results in otherwise indistinguishable divisions of a state. That's reminiscent to me of mark mark equals mark. What about a cloven space? A severance or cleavage shapes distinguishable states that are at different levels. And that, to me, implies a nested series. It's as if the divided space works horizontally and the cloven space works vertically. At least that's how I understand Spencer Brown to be using these terms in this work. So, from those initials, we start off with Theorem 1, which is all about form. And it states that the form of any finite cardinal number of crosses can be taken as the form of an expression. So that can look like this. The crosses can be adjacent, or it can look like this, and the crosses can be nested. And there can be any number of them in any combination. Let's prove it. We start with a space, and we call the space S. In that space, we have an expression. We find the deepest space. Now, theoretically, three options are possible. We could have a lack of expression, so the S is the deepest space. But he's talking about a finite number of crosses. So on the left, we have a single cross, or an expression that boils down to it. And here we have three adjacent ones. And they all contain the deepest space in that expression. On the right, we have a series of nested crosses. And they're an even number, so you've got two pairs that can cancel out. The expression on the left, as I've mentioned, reduces to one mark. The expression on the right reduces to no marks, the unmarked state. So 
actually only two options are possible, either marked or unmarked. So the form of any finite cardinal number of crosses can be taken as the form of an expression. Theorem 2 is all about content, and it states that if any space pervades an empty cross, the value indicated in the space is the marked state. The proof is very simple. There are only two simple options, either marked or unmarked. So if there is an empty cross, it is by definition going to be marked. Theorem 3 is about agreement, and it states that the simplification of an expression is unique. How do we prove that? Well, we're going to use the letter M to stand for any number greater than zero of expressions indicating the marked state, and N for the same relating to the unmarked state. If we put a number of expressions that are marked adjacent to each other, they condense and reduce to a marked state. Similarly, it doesn't matter how many expressions you have adjacent to each other to unmark, they all uh, cancel out and cancel out to the unmarked state. And that's by axiom one. Let's remind ourselves of axiom one, the law of coring. That's what it says. And if you have two different values of expression side by side, they will always reduce to a marked state. And we know that by theorem two or by simplification. We'll look at both options. Let's remind ourselves of theorem two. There are only two formal or simple options, marked or unmarked. The simplification of an expression is unique, and we know this because if you have mark and unmarked expressions uh, side by side, the unmarked cancels and you're left with the mark. But what happens if you have either a marked expression or an unmarked expression under a cross? like this. Well, the red M under the white mark forms a pair of nested marks. They can be cancelled, so you're left with an unmarked state. And if you put a grey pair of nested marks under the white mark, you can remove them, cancel them, and you're left with the mark. Either way, there are no other options. You're always left with marked or unmarked values. And if they appear side by side, then you're left with the marked state. Here's the proof. We're going to go this, through this step by step. We have an expression E. It's more complex than the ones we've used before. And we're going to mark the deepest space, D. How do we find the deepest space? Well, space? well, we count from the outside. If space 0 is on the outside, this is space 1, 2, 3, and 4. Level 4 is the deepest space, so we'll put all our Ds there. Now, we go outside that. So outside level 4, we're going to mark the outside of each of the deepest crosses with an M for a marked state. And we're going to do that wherever the D appears. Now, we're looking for crosses that cover the mark M. And we're going to label those N. Can you see how many Ns we're going to end up with at this level? Pause the video and see if you can work it out. And then hit the play button again and see whether you agree. So, I have one, two, and three. Now, we're still at level three. If there's a mark at level three that doesn't cover a mark M, let's mark it. There we go. Now we go to level two. If a cross covers a mark M, we label it N. How many of them are there that need to be marked? Pause the video, work it out. Right. There's one at this level. 
Now, if there's a mark at level 2 that doesn't cover an M, we do mark it M, but there isn't. So we go to the next level. If a cross covers a mark M, let's label it N. Can you see which one will be labelled? There it is, on the far right. And if it doesn't, mark it M. There's only one that doesn't. So this whole expression has a dominant value of a marked state in space 1, and therefore the value of A is marked. Now that's a very complicated way of some, uh, saying something that is actually very simple. And it's no wonder that he calls this simplification. He was all about simplifying. Let's take this methodically from the left to the right. You have bottom left two marks that condense to one. There we go. And that creates a nested pair which can be cancelled and another which can be cancelled and another can be cancelled leaving a single mark. To the right of that there are two pairs, one can be cancelled, the second can be cancelled, and we're left with a single mark, which shows that that expression has a value of a marked state. Therefore, that expression is marked. That's all for session three. In session four, we'll be looking at three more theorems from chapter four. Hope you can join me.